say anything. So this is the hierarchy control from the ANSI Z10 standard that came out a couple years ago. And of course, when it comes out, it doesn't get in the test right away. You have to have people that know about this, that sit on the committee to write these test questions for the, you know, the eight different tests the board administers. So elimination is the, the first one, and substitution is going to be the next. That means you're going to substitute a, a cancer-causing chemical in a solvent for a non-cancer-causing. Ventilation is a common engineering control, dust controls, um, you know, barriers uh, that are, you know, for uh, noise is an engineering control. And then they added the new one, warnings, you know, it could be um, visible or warnable systems, you know, like uh, alarms before things happen, signs and barriers and labels. So this is an arc flash barrier. So this is a, a case where you're going to designate the 42 inches where the only a trained qualified person wearing the arc flash equipment can work on a live electrical and it keeps people out of the area. And then there's administrative calls such as training, uh, safe work permits, um, and communication work management. And then they added PPE is always the last one. I grew up with five of these. Now the warning is a new one and they're getting it on a lot of questions. People have mentioned five, uh, four on the last uh, test for somebody else here. Hold on, let me get the chat up here. So, according to the hierarchy of controls, what's the most effective method to control arc flash hazards and risks in the workplace for non-electrical workers? A, PPE, B, worker rotation in the area, C, training, D, barriers. You can type in chat. That's the easiest way to, to go through here when I get a couple answers and stuff. This is what I call pick the best of the five. And the answer is D. Okay. And sometimes, you know, a lot of times, you like I said, they'll list uh, four of them, and you have to scramble which is the right order. You know, they might start out with, you know, barriers, uh, training, um, pre, you know, PPE, and then engineering controls. Well, that would be wrong because engineering controls is first, you know. What's the least effective method of controlling hazards and risks in the workplace? Now, we're not dealing with non-electrical. We're just dealing overall PPE, administrative controls, Engineering controls or elimination. So you have to know this table. It is PPE. PPE is the last resort. I just highlighted the wrong one. All right. In training, there's this ADDI model, you know, analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And people particularly uh, that have training as part of their blueprint have started getting this in there. The construction one, I have not seen it yet, but ASP, CSP, SMS, and of course, if you take the certified instructional trainer. Um, and idea is you're going to do a needs analysis. The needs analysis is that we have to know what kind of workers we have. We have to find out what they've had in the past. And that's, that's a fundamental area in a certification test for uh, the CIT. Then you're going to do learning objectives. At the end of the class, the students will learn about three methods of applying safety management to a real workplace. You know, that would be an example of an objective. The students will be able to find and apply the knowledge of a Delphi incident investigation. And then you're going to develop the material. Uh, that could take a long time. You know, typically, if I've not done it before, it might take a day to develop an hour. And then uh, implement uh, the training, and hopefully it goes good. And then you're going to conduct formal evaluations, uh, immediate feedback evaluations. There's four levels of evaluations. And this is going to be the typical ADDI method. And uh, so they're asking people about it. So let's take a look at a sample question. Which phase of the model involves creating a detailed plan for the instructions, including the learning objectives and assessment strategies? Now, when you get these questions, these are hard because you have to kind of read this slow. Is it analysis, A, B, design, C, development, D, implementation? Okay. It is design. It is design. You're creating the plan. That's designing the plan. So 
again this is a tough one and you know I always tell people you just can't read what I just went on with the model and then say I'm gonna go remember it. this one's gonna take you some time to go through and think about each of the steps You've completed the design and development of the new training program and you're now ready to deliver it to the target audience. So which phase of the Eddy model are you currently in? And you, that's why I said you have to know the plan. So I always tell people if you can write the Eddy model chart out and give examples of it, then that's an easy way to say that I, I do know these five elements. Okay. It is the implementation. Now we're going to, you know go in and deliver you're going to implement it so this is these are tough questions because you know it's just the style of the wording is is very tough for a lot of people you don't see questions like this and one more uh, you've delivered new training programs to the target audience and now you want to assess its evaluations and identify areas of improvement which phase of the ADI model are you in so what is assessing the effectiveness very good evaluation I just bring up uh, the uh, new ANSI standard on gloves. Uh, they've come up with what they call impact rating, and they go from one to three. You don't have to know that, but there are uh, ratings for cut resistant, puncture resistant, abrasion resistance, and tearability of it. So a company safety manager, I call these are scenario questions. What would be your initial step to address the recent increases in hand injury of your company? Retrain all workers in hand and arm safety. B, buy more PPE and enforcer use. C, conduct a root cause analysis. D, carry out a training needs assessment. You'll have several scenario-based questions, probably 10 of them at least in the test. There it is, conduct a root cause analysis. So, you know, I work for one of the large construction companies as a consultant. And we went through all the injuries. Out of 122, 70 were hand injuries. Out of those 70 hand injuries, we started doing the root cause analysis. And guess what? A lot of people were handling objects and getting impact into the another either a wall or a beam or another object, and it caused either you know uh, a strain, sprain, broken hand, that kind of thing. So we've gone to the impact resistant gloves. So if you're going to handle objects, cut resistant gloves are not good enough. You're going to have to have at least an ANSI level 2 impact resistance when you're going to handle objects. So for the average worker, you're going to have to have two sets of gloves because you can use the cut resistant gloves for everyday workout at the facility or at the site, but when you're going to handle material, you're going to have the ANSI impact gloves. Okay, very good. ISO 45000. Now, it used to be, you have to know all the ISOs. You have to know quality, environmental, and, and the ones that are in the uh, Facebook study group. Remember, you can search, you know, ASP and ISO, and you can get all the questions that are related to ISO. So, used to be you had to know what ISO 45001 was. But that's not it anymore. Now they're asking you a little bit more about it. What are the principles of the ISO? Worker participation and consultation, leadership and commitment, uh, risk brace approach, and continual improvement. Okay, we'll cover some of these topics here. Um, I go do audits all the time at a lot, you know, food companies and other companies construction. Uh, one of the things that I went out there was I went to a place I'd been before, and I was shocked to see that the conveyor had emergency pull cards and an emergency stop. And I was asking that because you usually don't see that when you go to a company that has been through it. I didn't do that. I wonder what, where that came from. Um, he has an STS. He said, after your visit, I felt like I didn't know safety. So I took the safety train supervisor, which is the industry safety, and I looked at it, and they talk about conveyor guarding because conveyors are the number one source of deaths and amputations and, and in running parts and things like that. And uh, he said, I started realizing that this is in there. So my highest auto score in the last three years is a, a plant manager who's gotten an STS, which is a good thing, not just a safety person. Which is the following, not a key component of the ISO 45001 approach to the safety and health management. 
worker participation consultation, encourage the workers to participate in occupational safety and health decision making, leadership commitment, demonstrate top management commitment to occupational safety and health, risk-based approach, identify and assess, control occupational health and safety risks, financial performance improvement, focus on increasing profits through cost-cutting measures. Yeah, boy, everybody got that one very fast, yes. You know, because it's not, the minute you see money, that's not the issue in safety. It is, but it's not going to be on these tests. They, they always want you to work on the safety aspect, and, you know, that's another issue. So the requirements, you remember the principles are one. The requirements are you're going to do these hazard identification risk assessments. Uh, you're going to develop uh, controls to mitigate the risk. So what we have here is, you know, our food facility with our STS, you know, whatever it was, uh, you know, two years ago, they were moving these little carts. First, they're low, they're down, you know, a little bit above your knee, almost at your uh, lower, you know, waist, and they were pushing them, and they were very tough to push. You know, he said, well, they're only like 45, 50 pounds. Well, you could push that, and it's hard, but it creates ergonomic issues. And so this year, he went out, and they bought carts with wheels. So you now you can just take this thing and... It's like pushing five or six pounds of pressure. So that's the risk control that he did. Uh, emergency preparedness and response. We have natural disasters everywhere in the world. You have to have plans for it, and uh, would include even active shooters. Um, worker training awareness. Make sure the workers know the hazards and, and can spot it. One of the trainers I was with this week, uh, he said, you know, we teach the workers these safety items because if they see something unsafe, they have to, you know, we want them to mention it because they're the last line of defense. So they, you know, this one company, like I said, they believe that if they don't train them, then the worker's not going to speak up about a hazard because they don't even know it's there. And, and that's what they want because, you know, they all know what the rules are and we want the company to have a safe program. We want the workers to go home every night. But you see something, you got to say something because you, if you don't, then nobody else is going to say it maybe. And then regularly review the system, you know. So which ISO 45001 is aimed at preventing occupational safety and health incidents by implementing controls to mitigate risk? Emergency uh, preparedness and response, worker training and awareness, risk control, and incident investigation and reporting. A little easier when you see the same word in the question and the answer. So very good, risk control. This uh, 2009 Accident uh, Prevention Manual uh, by the Safety uh, National Safety Council out of Itasca uh, hasn't been a source of questions, but it's been a, on the reference book. You know, Yates book is get most, I want to say, if you had to buy one book, you'd get Yates, but I have the National Safety Council books over the years, and all of a sudden now, you know, obviously the group that wrote the test is asking questions on their models, and the model that they, you know, they show uh, what they call the safety excellent model is not exactly the areas of the question. So if you know the safety management uh, uh, things from OSHA, then that will be probably helpful. But, you know, you're going to have leadership and uh, measurement be the central part of your safety program. And then you're going to determine through gaps what the uh, company's goals would be. You know, we always try to say we want zero accidents, but we also want to say, 100% of our audits are in 97 or higher. You know, we, we get, um, you know, for 100 workers, we get 100 suggestions of things to make the job better or safer or quality. And then we talk about um, best practices and we go through this. And then we talk about how we're going to implement our plans. We're going to do daily training, toolbox talks every week. We're going to go out and conduct uh, audits of everybody working once a month. And then... Uh, distribute our best practices, you know, train people so that they see this is the way we do it and then measure our results by seeing that we've got lower worker comp, that we have high scores, 100% training, things like that. So one of these questions, I, I always call them um, two are right, one is wrong question. These are hard to do. I mean, don't, don't be surprised when you kind of like, oh, I don't like this question. Nobody likes these questions. In the context of effective workplace safety program, which trio responsibility is deemed essential? 
So right there, you have to remember, usually two are going to be right, one is going to be wrong. Managing pre-qualifying subcontractors, training orientation to site safety, ensuring facility security upkeep. You know, that's not in the model you saw. That's the OSHA one. Managing budget and finance, overseeing equipment and tools, handling emergency response and medical care, B. C is overseeing administrative management tasks, handling operational technical aspects, promoting cultural and behavior norms, and D, enforcing discipline, counting, facility training and development, and C, and, and conducting uh, safety management audits. This is hard. This is an exam core question. When you pay a thousand bucks to get 999 questions, this is the one that I saw in exam core. And I know it references the 2009 because they tell it to you. This is tough. What they're looking for, and, and don't be surprised if you got it wrong, is overseeing administrative management tasks, operational technical aspects, and promoting the safety arms. Okay. That's that's the issue. Finance, just to throw that one out. Security, security, upkeep. We're not thinking about cleaning the place. That's not our main job in safety. And then... Um, um, enforcing the the discipline or hr functions boy that's tough that's tough you know don't be surprised but you try to eliminate the bad one maybe there's two bad ones but you just try to go through it and say really which one is what i do in safety you know and again um three categories you know like i said administrative is policy development when you get into the national safety council book um Operational technical means hazard identification, risk assessment, and control. And cultural behavior means promoting a safety culture and participation. So when you read this, you're thinking, is that what that means? Yeah. I mean, I had to go back to the 2009 book and read this. And, you know, so it is uh, an issue. OSHA's seven points are more realistic. That's why I tell people, remember these at least, and then if you get a question, it won't tell you it's a National Safety Council question or an OSHA question, but this one is talking about management, leadership, and commitment, worker participation, identify all the hazards and conduct an assessment, take uh, controls for these hazards, do education and training the workers, evaluate your program and continually improve it, and then coordinate the contractors. So that's a good example of, you know, something you should know. You should know the OSHA one. There's a 2015 guideline uh, that preceded a 1989 guideline. That'll help you on these questions. Um, one of the sites I go at, they got designated spotters for aerial lifts. They have flaggers. You're going to bring equipment. You're going to low, lower stuff or raise stuff on a construction site. You're going to be wearing this vest. And then all the, the, the foreman and the superintendent, the crafts leaderships, they wear a green vest. So you know who the boss is. And that's kind of nice. And then, of course, you know, safety people are going to wear the uh, uh, yellow high-vis vests. And then the workers will wear other ones. In order to form or foster a worker involvement in effective safety and health management program, which element is crucial to cultivating their commitment? Safety culture, safety performance incentives, highly skilled workers, discipline program. Another tough question. We know we can eliminate two of them. Cultivating. Cultivating what? The culture. The culture. The management. It takes usually two to three years to develop a safety culture if you have really no program. You know, I have to work with this and I work with companies for, you know, 10, 15 years. And, it, it, you know, it, sometimes you get the reluctant bosses at the top. And it's going to take time for them to understand the safety, why it's important, and everything else. And, you know, I've got uh, one company in uh, DuPage County, high injury rates forever, and then I, through a series of circumstances, I became uh, uh, the, the one that's going to come out and help them out every month. And, uh, and I says, wow, you have a lot of accidents. You pay way over everybody else. Your EMR, experience modification rate, is 1.12. That means you're paying more injuries than your average in your your area which is crazy and it's a lot of stuff that they weren't doing audits and training they just did what they did to meet the minimum OSHA things and I said no we let's just do this so we look at the place every month we walk it out and then we look at all the workers and then we go through all the training programs we investigate every accident and then we have monthly meetings with the manager on a safety topic and it's gone down this year 
after we're now we've been doing this since 219 so this is going to be our sixth year or yes yeah, sixth year um we're at trending at 0.64 he's the best in the nation now the best in the nation he had in 30 years had never got an injury rate at the average now he's best so when he got below you know 1.97 his insurance company dropped the rates quite a bit because you know he, he's saving them money and now he pays a third of what he paid a few years ago and you don't have to tell him about safety because now he understands it you know it took a few years oh do we have to really do this this guard costs five thousand dollars well you're gonna get cited if they come here you know i'm not gonna call osha but you need to think about it and then once you start saving money now he's starting to do it now he's buying equipment he's starting to think about how we can make it better more efficient more safer and, and that's what you can do in these things incident causal analysis don't look at this one i you know if you read the four factors it focuses on equipment management environment machine the ishikawa or fishbone design originally was started man method materials and then has evolved so it was like we had two japanese working on a management uh thing for incidents that was similar to the national safety council one and and you just have to remember these are issues that are going to be affecting an accident or an incident and you you know they're spelling ones because I, I play with chat gpt and for some reason you know a 10 billion dollar uh, computer cannot spell correctly so but the four main areas which is the fourth that means it's like any of these questions if there's four things five things you got to know them all so we covered equipment management personnel what was the fourth area i covered risk manage risk tolerance budget schedule environment very good it was environment hazard assessment job hazard analysis job safety analysis um, you know the task, list them in steps, tell the hazards, and then what the controls are. A very simple form. OSHA's going to redo their whole hazard analysis class, job hazard analysis class. And uh, one of the things is they, they focus on something so simple, and they give easy ones. But I says, I'll give you some of the ones that I've done that have like 14 hazards in the process of everything. And I gave them examples, and they're like, wow. I says, because I know if you teach them a couple things, you get a big one it's a little bit different so when i do a hazard assessment i'm going to have a lot of things if you got to use a five inch grinder what's the test we got to take off the weld burst so after you weld you're going to have a little slag and you'd use a grinder it'll be in our fabrication shop at this facility and uh, we're going to wear safety glasses cut resistant gloves uh, dust mask or n95 respirator and then worried about you know cuts from the the grinding wheel because uh this stuff is going to be sharp so we're going to have a guard on it and the hazards are you know sharp edges on the the wheel flying particles and and just this one hazard we're only at one it's got ppe as a safety shield side glasses um steel toed shoes long sleeve and pants just from the flying particle area and then you know we got a laceration ergonomics and so on so i just show examples these things can be quite long um and and when you sit there and have everybody's experience then you then you have to address those issues what main factor would be emphasized in an industrial safety strategy during a hazard assessment of a new product or process in your facility a the work environment b transitioning to robotics and automated work tasks c managing potential incidents at the job level d addressing industry specific hazards tough question tough question we know we can throw out b so what do you think it is? Managing potential instance at the job level. So we have to look at the task, watch the task, and then talk to the workers. What are our steps? What are the hazards at each step? Okay. Again, this is, you know, if you think about what you do, this helps and is easier for people who have done these hazard analysis job hazard analysis if you've never done one you might want to try some because then you understand 
Yeah, we're going to look at the hazard assessment. The work environment's part of it, but it's just a component of that whole thing. Same thing, we're going to look at what the industry does. You know, what are the hazards of the industry seeing? And we're going to address those hazards as we write the steps down. But we're really trying to manage the whole incident and not get any injuries. What key consideration? Whenever you see it highlighted, that means there might be all right answers. Which is the best of the right answers? This one drives people crazy because you're, you're now forced to pick between three good and one very good or excellent answer. What is consideration for a safety manager aiming to get an effective job hazard safety analysis? Thoroughly identify all past occurrences associated with the task. Utilize a consistent form and number of work tasks to enhance usability across all analysis. Ensure the analysis is signed by every team member involved. Empower the work team to collaborate in, complying and in compiling and discussing the analysis at the work location. Okay. Three right and one really good answer. Very good. It is D. Uh, sometimes the longest answer is if you're in doubt, you know, that might be what you choose. You know, it doesn't work all the time. If you especially get Janet, the test writer, Janet, she knows that. So everything's equal length. You know, she's not going to give you that. But the idea is you're going to sit there and have the team talk about what is the process because they're going to know it better than you will. And then what are the hazards of it? And then talking about the analysis. And I always get the team members because sometimes you find out, no, that's not the way we do it. And you thought, Oh, okay. How do we do it then? Behavior. They're asking a lot of questions on behavior. What would you do about behavior? Um, we had a case in uh, Chicago uh, last month where a person was killed after a driver went the wrong way on a Wednesday on a, the Kennedy Expressway, which is one of the big expressways. Um, and it was a person that came into the head-on traffic. Now, when you work with trucking companies, everything's on film. A lot of companies that have company vehicles that are in construction, they have everything on video. And they will know when you're doing something like extreme braking, extreme acceleration, and they'll pop up the camera. They can watch you drive live and coach you. You know, like J.B. Hunt was telling my friend Jake, hey, Jake, I just noticed you braked uh, suddenly. What's going on? Oh, this guy cut in front of me, and they're backing up the video, and they can see it. This one, the person hit the accelerator to make a sharp left because they had made a wrong turn into live traffic. No different than the case up at the Vernon Hills. So when we go in and we want to analyze some factors related to why an experienced driver made this mistake that could have killed people or himself, what, will, what do we see in the photo alone that gives us some factors for this driver? Anybody? Is it raining? Is it raining? It's raining. What else? Driving at night. Very good. Those are big factors. And unfamiliar area. And having to make a tough decision where the lane is. And you know, and it's just a mistake and thankfully nothing happened. This is what we call a this is a lot of it's, no 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 uh, DUI because even though um, they're gonna ask, there was no there's nothing uh, you know, this is this is a near miss, so uh, because you know it could have been very bad. I mean you're you're talking you could have killed somebody like this Vernon Hills man. We're just gonna say, Hey Jake, uh, we have a clinic over here, you need to drive to it, take a drug test and he was clean. It was clean. So it wasn't that, but it was a lot of factors in it. And and this is, you know, even your best people can make a mistake. You know, they know the rules. You just, I said, I couldn't see the lane. It was raining and, and the lanes blended in with the road. And I thought it, I made a turn. And then I realized to my horror, I looked to my left. It was clear. I drove right in there and got on the, the other street. But these are, you know, cases where the, the, the companies are, putting and looking at behavior on forklift drivers, truck drivers, because truck drivers is the most hazardous occupation in the United States with over 800 dying a year. So these big companies and a lot of companies, they're watching the speeds and everything else. And this is, you know, trying to change behavior. So the idea is we're going to monitor behavior. We're going to change behavior. That's why I like going out every month and just watching everybody work because I can see if they're wearing the right PPE, they're doing their jobs right everybody knows something and then we're going to 
coach or change behavior. You know, we have to take in effect that there was a lot of factors in this case where, you know, we had person, you know, because we had to have something done and get over and do a delivery at a late hour, which we normally wouldn't do, that affected a lot of factors, especially in there. I mean, I just dealt with one the other day where they ran into a bridge, doesn't know the area, is using the Google Maps. Well, Google Maps doesn't tell you how to hide the bridge, is you have to look at the bridge. And, you know, they were watching the thing because they were on unfamiliar territory. And, of course, that one destroyed the truck, which, you know, $70,000 loss. So nobody hurt, nobody killed, but you got to sell a lot of product to sell, make up a brand new truck. So by changing this behavior, we reduce the risk. And then we hopefully thinking about outcomes are going to be reducing crashes and hopefully no traffic violations. He got no traffic violations, you know. I can't imagine what the terror was like, you know. <laughs> You head on traffic and you're thinking, oh my God, if I don't make a decision, they're coming right at me. And maybe they see him because he had his lights on. You know, we could tell from the truck. They have put things like this, the USA driving things, where we can score the drivers. How close they break, why do they stop, how fast are they going. And it, it'll score them. And, you know, if you've got drivers that are not going good or they're driving like uh, race car drivers, then you got high risk. And do you have to, you have to make a decision. Do you want them to drive for your company? So in the context of managing work teams, which factors should the safety professional be mindful from a safety standpoint? Fear of failure and discipline, unconscious and deliberate risky behaviors, uh, personality difference and habits, cultural diversity and ethnicity. Another case of several good answers, but one is better related to safety. It is unconscious and deliberate risky behaviors. Okay. Corrective actions related to a safe work practice are most effective. Again, whenever you highlight the big word, you probably a lot of good answers, and we're looking for the best of the four answers. Related to occurrence, behavior, and consequence, ordered by senior management, coupled with retraining associated with discipline. Think of our case with our head-on driver here. Very good. A, related to occurrence behavior. Because we've got a not safe work practice and we're going to investigate it as if this was. Because, you know, I've had companies where they have had these kill people and it's millions of dollars. So this is a free lesson and we're going to learn from it and then we're going to also share it with other people. We're not going to embarrass the driver, but we want to be talking about this issue. You know, you got a lot of these factors. And, you know, and, and this is a tough one because the person's got a good record. It's just that made a mistake, and thankfully, thankfully, nobody got hurt. The Delphi method is our last one. They put this on the test again, the new group put in there. Um, I'd never seen the Delphi come up there. I know what it is. Um, I, I used another one. I use a, I, you know, some people call it the commission method. Some people call it the panel method. But, it, you know, it goes back uh, a long ways. Uh, so I'm going to explain for four slides what the, the Delphi method is and, and so you know a little bit about it because um, what I don't know is where they're getting um, the resources on it. it it's, it's in a couple books, but they don't go into it too detailed, you know. As I learned it, you know, a long time ago um, when uh, the space shuttle blew up, you know, it, it was kind of like a blurb and they talk about this is the Delphi method. And it really didn't explain it much, you know, and just said, it's just a group of people. Well, that's true. You pick a panel of experts, a lot of diversity in it. Define the problem. Why did the Shea shuttle blow up? Over here, we got a photo of Chernobyl. Why was there a meltdown in the reactor? Because everybody in the world that has a nuclear reactor wants to know, how do we prevent the reoccurrence of this? You know, what was the factors on this? And if you haven't seen the show Chernobyl, you should, because it's an eye-opening experience for some of the limitations of the equipment, so how the training was done, and, you know, of course, you know, how they, they try to deal with it. Uh, initial questionnaires, a lot of times, uh, you know, they may not have a formal questionnaire. It might be just a meeting. But they're going to go over there and talk about this is our objectives on this uh, panel or this, um, you know, group of people, of experts, and we're going to try to, you know, solve the area and come up with recommendations and, and causal factors related to this. So the group's going to get together, get all the information, do investigations. You can imagine the time for this. These are not for, you know, a simple accident. 
Uh, these are going to take some time to do. Sometimes you may see this in smaller companies where, you know, they, they might do it for an incident. And you don't realize you're doing this method. Um, they're going to get uh, feedback after everybody comes up with their ideas, and they're going to try to summarize them and then talk about what the consensus seems to initially focus on. And then they're going to go through a couple rounds of this, you know, where they debate it and stuff. Because remember, you're bringing people in. You may not be able to bring everybody in one location. The magic of Zoom and everything else means you're going to have to have a, a, a scribe, you know, and pass. You know, Zoom records and, and does everything. You can keep minutes, but a lot of times uh, this might be all remote. And then you finalize a final report. So, you know, like even with COVID, you know, started in Wuhan, China. A lot of people got together with in the United States and other countries talking about what do we want to do. We, we're seeing 3,000 people die in China. It's going to come to our United States eventually. going to come to Europe. What do we want to have in place? Do we want to have people wear PPE? Do we have a method of protection, which is now? So the advantage of it, because they'll ask you what the advantages are, it Different people, different background. Everybody brings their own set of skills and uh, experiences, and that's what's nice about it. Um, the idea is that if we're all safety professionals, maybe we all think kind of the same way. So we might bring in other people that have other expertise. And hopefully by going back and forth and getting feedback and talking about you know what this person thinks and you know going through is good, bringing the pros and cons of that, that idea or do we need to investigate further is good. This is the Warren Commission where they brought together like a panel to, to look at Kennedy's assassination. And they, you know, spent years, like I want, I want to say two years on this investigation. So it's not there. Chemical Safety Board does a similar thing with their accidents that they're investigating. The limitations of the Delphi method, um, it's time consuming. Uh, talks about rounds of questioning. Uh, remember, remember, questioning might be summarizing, talking back and forth. These are the factors and initial draft, second draft, third draft, and things like that. It depends on the experts. Remember, you know, everybody here has got different skills, and and difference of one person being on the panel or another could make, you know, the outcome something potentially doing there. It doesn't capture rare events, and I always use, um, you know, the top photo is. Uh, Deepwater Horizon, a drilling rig explosion that killed it and then dumped, you know, millions upon millions of crude oil into the Gulf of Mexico. But a good example of a rare event would be the, the miracle on the Hudson with Captain uh, Sully, you know, where the birds hit the plane so hard that he had to do an emergency landing. You know, they had literally a Delphi method, a panel to evaluate was the issue. And if you've ever seen the movie Sully, that's a very good movie because the panel felt... He should have been able to go over and divert to uh, the neighboring airport. And their simulations showed that it could be done. And they showed the simulation, but they didn't tell people it took 18 tries with this simulation and the expert pilots to do this landing. And he's got to make a decision in the first, you know, 10 seconds what we're going to try to do. So... That's the case. You would have never figured a bird strike could knock an airplane out that you had to do an immediate landing. It does damage, but usually you have a chance to return. You know, this is the first case where the, you, you got to go somewhere in within 30 seconds, and that's it. You know. So, primary purpose: to identify the root cause of the accident, estimate the likelihood and potential consequence of accidents, determine the cost of implementing safety measures, to assign blame for the accident. We know blame is never going to be an answer. So we can throw out D. Estimate potential and consequence of accidents. Very good. And the key characteristic of the Delphi method involves single round of questioning, requires a large group of experts with identical backgrounds, uses structured communication techniques to gather and distill knowledge, relies solely on quantitative data. This is a pretty easy question, I think. Very good. C. Any questions on all we covered? Got it just about an hour. It'll be up on YouTube uh, within probably 40 minutes or so. I copy it right. And like I said, we'll do another one next month. Uh, if you're on LinkedIn or on the Facebook BCSP study group, let me know what topics you're thinking of next. You know, what you'd like to see next. I've had, you know, a bunch of them. 
I mean, I'm not going to do engineering not economy because it's like one question for a lot of people, but I want to go into issues where you might get four questions on it and we have to cover an issue. Fleet safety is a good one. Training, edu training education is on there already. So you have to think of what do we cover that's not already in the training video and stuff. So things like that. Otherwise, I thank you very much for coming and I appreciate everybody coming today. And I'll see you next month.